just a brief intro. Uh, kit houses were produced in the United States beginning at the beginning, uh, beginning in the first decade of the 20th century. And their popularity lasts till the 1950s, and they're real big in the 10s and 20s. And to talk more about them today, please welcome Ron Campbell. But thank you for coming out tonight and inviting me back. Uh, I think we were here uh, a year or so ago on train depots. And uh, tonight is on Kit Homes. Um, my role at the county is historic preservation. I work for the Main Street program, which Rochester is a Main Street community. I do the design work for businesses, free of charge. Uh, it's all paid by the uh, county. Uh, and it's part of the Main Street program. We have something like 23 communities that are part of the program. And uh, between that and historic preservation, it keeps me pretty darn busy. Um, Preservation, I, um, I started a little lecture series. There's about six, seven programs that we talk on various subjects. And the idea is just to acquaint Oakland County with the treasures that we have here, whether it be architecture or the rails to trails or even kid homes. So my, um, l let me give some credits when I start off. Oh, good. I, I was pushing the wrong button. Technology challenge. I, I just want to give um, some credit to uh, uh, Pat McKay. You probably, many of you know Pat. Uh, he was helpful in uh, helping me with some of the houses here in uh, Rochester. And also Steve Hudler and, and Rad Jones. Uh, you might be familiar with them too. Fascinating people. Um, and then Andy and Wendy uh, Much, they, are, uh, they do a, a kid home presentation. They concentrate on Sears home. In fact, they live in a Sears kit home. And uh, they go into a deep dive. So what you're going to see tonight is more of a, an overview of how kit home started. And we're going to go back a little bit before um, uh, that, that period, which uh, the 20s, 30s was the prime time, you say. But we'll learn out that they went on into the 80s. In fact, they're making a resurgence now. So with that, uh, where we are today, um, where have we had site-built homes? Uh, they've been around forever, right? Um, since probably the person first created a shelter for themselves. Then we have the manufactured homes, which really started what we think of today around 1926, and it was more of the trailer that was pulled behind the motoring public with this newfangled thing called the automobile. Uh, World War II, they really took off after World War II as uh, uh, the men returned from war, started families, and uh, we needed quick housing. In 1976, it was, it was interesting. Um, the Congress passed the, uh, what was known as the Manufactured Housing Construction and Safety Act, which was basically they had to build the HUD standards. Um, and then in 1980, they also passed legislation that said a mobile home could also be called manufactured housing. And the difference between manufactured housing and uh, mobile homes is that uh, manufactured housing conforms to the national standard of building, uh, I'm sorry, to the local, state or local standards. So they get a little more specialist. And then we have modular panelized. And you say, oh, all these names are coming up. I can't keep track of them. Well, just think of it as that there was a desire and a need for larger houses than what some of these kit homes or manufactured homes were providing. And so they built the components, much as a modular home or a, a manufactured home, and you just assemble them in a the field, okay? So now let's say, well, that's where we're at today, but how did we get here? Well, we started out with, again, the site-built home, right? And your house, if it looks like this, could have been site-built. If your house looks like this, it could have been a catalog or mail order plan, okay? And we'll see the difference there. And if it looks like this, well, it could have been a kit home. So you say, okay, what is all that? What are you trying to tell me here, Ron? Okay, let's, let's do it in terms of cooking, baking a pie. A site built home, I get all the ingredients, right? I get the apples, I get the pie crust, the flour, all the seasonings, and I put it together, and I come up with a pie. A catalog home, think of it as just a recipe book. I got 20 different recipes I could choose from to make an apple pie, probably 1,020, right? 
And if I did a kid home, I go down, I get a package of apples, I get a pre-made pie crust, and I put them together. And what do we end up with? Doesn't matter. It's always an apple pie, whether it's site built, stick built, or, or the catalog uh, plans, or the, the site. So let's, let's go back a little bit further now and say, well, where did all this start? Now, I'm an architect by training, okay? But I've always had a love of history. And I always want to say, well, when was this first developed? How did this really come about? And it was interesting because uh, I found that um, Ashler Benjamin, 1872, he was born. He did kind of the first architectural handbook in the, in the country. And it was to acquaint the really the uneducated public into the uh, ideals of Greek uh, and classical uh, proportions. And he brought that to the general public. He wrote something like seven books uh, during his lifetime. And he really set those, um, I guess, to a point where people were referring to him. They were really popular. Then move ahead, just as he's dying, as his career is ending, up on the, the um, horizon comes this young person, Andrew Jackson Downing, with an um, accomplice, I'll, I'll say, who was... <coughs> um, let me think, um, Andrew Jackson Davis. Now, confuse that, always confused me. Uh, Downing was more of a landscape architect. Davis was more of the architect. But they would combine, and they gave us these uh, beautiful little books, a thesis on uh, the theory and practice of landscaping. And they matched a lot of the Italianate structures and the Gothic structures with the landscape. And I always tell people, I have another presentation that talks about architectural styles. And you see the Gothic style, and you, you always see it probably in a, well, oftentimes in a city setting. But you got to remember, when this style was built, it wasn't in a city setting. It had landscaping around it. Okay, So again, this was kind of a, a, a challenge to people to say, well, this is how you should build. And lo and behold, you probably heard of East Lake if you're a collector of antiques, right? Furniture, uh, furniture maker, architect, uh, designer, who greatly influenced the popular taste in decors in the uh, 1870s and 80s. And his book um, came out as a, a mail order, I'll say, of plans. So you could send for this book, uh, kind of a better housekeeping, you know, those plan books that you can go to the drugstore now and buy. And then there was this gentleman uh, by the name of Barber who really uh, made this uh, plan idea book take off. Uh, he published The Cottage Souvenir in 1890. Um, it contained 59 house designs, okay? 48 of those are on the National Register now. Incredible. Every state in the Union has one. And two, I think it's the Philippines and Japan also has one of his plans uh, actually built. So this sold across the country, across the world, really. And you think of it, this was in 1890. And uh, America was already starting to influence um, the homes and the, the types of structures we live in. So then I said, okay, well, why, how did all this start? Because you have the planned catalogs, right? Well, if you go back, the first catalog, what I found is really Tiffany of 1845. It was called the Blue Book. I don't know how it got its name, but somehow. No, it got its name because the cover of the book was blue. And they still publish it. So if you want to order something from Tiffany, so you can go to the Blue Book and just order at your heart's will, you know, right? Then in 1872, Montgomery Ward came out with their catalog. And it called the Wish Book, right? And it really assured uh, Montgomery Ward a place in history uh, when New York um, Gothier Club displayed it as one of the most significant works in American history. Okay. So who's next on the agenda? Sears, you guys got it. You might as well be up here. I just grabbed a handout at the back and I'll leave. Sears catalog, um, it came out in 1894. And um, we'll see, we'll, that, this will appear later in the, the program too. So, what do we have today? The internet. 
But when do you think mail order catalogs reach their highest pinnacle? When were more sales created out of the catalogs than any other time? No. Nope. No. Nope. More recent than the 60s. Not quite. It was 1980. It reached its highest uh, level of um, uh, sales. Something like $19 billion worth of sales in the catalog. And now the internet's taken it down. It's, it's really dropped off. It's half that now um, since then. So then I say, okay, there's, there's got to be more influences, right, that, that creates these, uh, all these connections. Things have to fall together just right for all this to happen. And so uh, I kept seeing about the population and how the demographics of the United States was changing. We were moving from an agricultural society to an urban and for the first time in history, in about 1920, more people lived in cities than on the farm or in rural areas. So that influenced it. Another thing, bulk rate, mailing. All of a sudden, these catalogs could be shipped out pretty economically, right? We still get catalogs that we toss into the wastebasket, right? Bulk mailing, bulk mailing. Um, but that entered in 19, or 1875. And then RFD. Anybody knows what RFD stands for? Rural Freedom. I love doing this for students because they have no idea, the little kids, what RFD. They always, well, not even Mayberry. It's not even around anymore, right? But 1896 was the RFD. And, and so now all of a sudden, mail order become much more practical. But... The biggest change of all, and I got to touch on the depots again, because what was it? The railroads. You could ship and manufacture at one end of the country and have it delivered at the other end of the country in what, a matter of days. Totally revolutionized history, um, not only in the United States, but everywhere. And tremendous railroad expansion. 70,000 miles of track were laid uh, between 1880 uh, and 1890, 164,000 miles of total track during that time. Even today, we are by far, we have more track mileage than any other country in the world. The one that's behind us, China. But we have twice as much as China does. So it, it, it really makes a, a, a statement. So now we've got all these things coming to a confluence, right? They, these are starting to interact with one another, and people are starting to realize the potential here. So you order by mail and you deliver by rail. That was a slogan at the time. Um, this, and kit homes were, was an American phenomenon. No other country in the world, except where we shipped them out, had anything like this. Um, Canada he had just a little bit of the market just because of proximity, and we'll see why, because uh, you'll see that the major manufacturers of Kit Homes was right here in Michigan. So, so what was a, a okay, well, a Kit Home, um, it's simply defined as a, a home where the majority of the major components, such as the framing, um, are all pre-cut and numbered, okay? And you get it home, you get it delivered to your site. You'll have to dig the basement. You'll have to lay the basement. Um, you'll have to put up the plaster. It'll come in bags. But everything is numbered and an uh, instruction book, right? And um, the idea was, well, what are you doing this weekend? Right? I need some help building my house. Right? You think it's hard to get somebody to get you to move, right? Well, think if you ask them to help you build a house. So all the designs were uh, standardized to, to maximum efficiency. They were purchased in bulk. And so the same argument that we make today for the revitalization of the kit home industry is what they made back then. Standardization, maximum efficiency, right? You're buying in bulk. Therefore, I can get the materials a lot cheaper than you could buying them individually. 
it reduces waste because we have it engineered out right to the precise thing. Now with laser technology, you know, we can cut. But even back then, they were cutting to prescribed lengths. So there was uh, a reduced waste. In fact, I'll, th I'll just throw this in. Do you know 40% of our landfills today come from construction materials? Mm -hmm. So anytime you can cut on waste, we've saved the environment, right? That's why I'm big on preservation, too. I won't go into that now. This, this is on kid homes. Okay. It's a controlled environment. I'm doing it inside. I'm not working out in the snow and the rain and the wind. I've got kind of pristine conditions. I'm warm. I've got good light. I should be able to construct these panels much more efficiently and uh, correctly than if I'm in the, the uh, uh, weather. Modern equipment and templates. This helps cut on the waste, but I'm cutting that same template over and over and over again. Uh, everything should fit because it's been tested. Skilled labor. Now, if I'm doing the same job over and over again, there's skilled labor. And by the way, where do you think that came from, that idea of doing the same job over? Yes, absolutely. And so here in Michigan, they were starting to recognize, well, look what Ford's doing down there with cars. Why can't we do this with homes? And I want to say this was one industry, too, that women were involved in right from the start. Um, Sears, they had a whole list of, uh, uh, I don't have this, this slide in here, but it shows a picture, a postcard, of just hundreds of women taking mail orders on this. But they were also involved in the design. They realized back then, who really ran the house? It was the women. Who do we have to please in order to make a sale? the women. So they would involve the women in, in selecting colors and, and design and layout. All of that was, and this was a higher paying job than what women would normally be associated with at this period in time. They had many models to choose from, right? They were always creating new models. So you order by mail, you deliver it by rail, um, you go down, oh, that is the picture, the employment of hundreds of women there in the Sears industry. So the order would be filled usually by um, a one or two railroad cars, depending on the size of home that you ordered. Okay, It's loaded at the company's mill, and it's sent to the customer hometown. So here in Rochester, you probably had a siding, and that was pulled off. The two cars, if you ordered one, and I know some of you, I, I've talked to a few of you, you grew up, and I know Donna, you grew up in a kit home, and uh, there's some people here that you're very well aware of the kit homes that were here in Rochester. So they would come, they'd be uh, sent, and usually you'd have two to three days to get those boxcars unloaded. And I don't know if you ever tried to unload a boxcar, but you know that's got to be a lot of work, right? Um, so they would park it on a siding, and if you weren't there, uh, that that boxcar is being tied up. You're gonna pay the railroad company for tying that car up. So they, they had a strategic way they loaded these boxcars. Um, typical house, it had anywhere between 10 to 30,000 pieces. And that included framing, siding, flooring, doors, windows, et cetera. 750 pounds of mail. I can't see what's coming up there. 27 gallons of paint. I guess I already mentioned the, the mail. So that was, that was your weekend, right? You got to go down. Now you got to get it to your house or your site. And typically you got to dig the basement because that didn't come with it. Um, if you're going to have a block foundation, sometimes the blocks came with it, sometimes it didn't. Okay. So you've got to line all this up. Either you're going to do it yourself, you're going to get a lot of friends to help you, um, or you're going to hire it done. But you've got your kit now. And we'll see later how um, the number on the joys, we talked about that earlier, I overheard some conversations, how the end of your rafters would be numbered or keyed. And uh, the little handouts you have there, uh, if we ran out, I've got extra, uh, we, or we can get you those. Um, 
but there were numbered instructions and uh, wants to uh, erect it and tell you what's going to come next. Once the materials arrive, again, you've got a loan uh, range for the local carpenter or contractor to assemble this house if you're not going to do it yourself. And they took a, advantage of advertising, just like the auto manufacturers, Good Housekeeping, Saturday Evening Post, uh, the Ladies Home Journal, all of these magazines actually carried ads because why not, right? These were the ladies that were selecting the designs and the house styles uh, you could get. So you could see down in the end, what is that, seventeen hundred? Yeah, seventeen ninety-five, just under eighteen hundred dollars. You could buy a kit home, yeah. or there's even one there for five-room house for four hundred eighty-three dollars. Not bad. Now. This is what I gauge advertising, right? Anytime you can get the movies to sell a product, whether it be Coke or whatever, you're in like Flint, right? So um, how many times have you seen the old comedies and the Murphy bed? And it was the ease, they would show the woman, of course, in the ad, putting it up real easy. But then the, all the comedians jumped on that and said, well, we can make a real vodka out of this, so let's, let's try it. So what about the kid homes? Yeah, did you know there was a movie starring Buster Keaton that centered around, um, what was it called, One Week, right? And the, the whole premise of this, the whole premise of this was Buster Keaton um, was the the quarter the uh, uh, that really won the woman, and he won it over his rival competitor for her hand, and no problem here. The rival was a gentleman, and he just said, um, "You know, you you got a good man, so I'm going to give you a wedding gift. I'm going to give you your kit home. Pretty nice." Right? The only problem was that he got to the kit before Buster Keaton did, and he changed around all the labeling. Okay. So when Buster goes to build it, it doesn't come quite like he thought it should. Now, this was quite a movie uh, because this was built on a round table, and it actually rotated. And they, so they could film it at different times of the day. Um, and, and to even make matters worse, they found out that they built it on the wrong site. So we got to move it. So, yes, you, somebody down here, you've seen it before then, right? You've seen it before because they get stuck on a railroad track and they hear the train coming, and it is a, it's all over. And they sit down on the side of the car, and they hear the train go by, but there's no crash or anything. And they turn, well, the train was on the other track, OK? But, whoop, but the other track had a train coming the other way, and it smashed it to smithereens. So that was the, the end of the movie. But any time you have that, that cinema promoting your product, even in a comedy form, it's good advertising, right? So let's take a look at oh, what, um, oh, that's the, the last one. That was the train getting demolished. And they actually did that with a train. I mean, th there was no special, the effects were what you filmed. You had one shot at it, right? So none of this imaging that they do now. Okay, so let's take a look. Um, Across the United States, and, and you say, well, when in the world? Aladdin Home was the first one to do it. And Aladdin Homes was out of Bay City, 1906. Okay, And we'll get into more of that in a little bit. But then the second one was in California. Another one out near Buffalo. Another one in Chicago, Illinois. Out in Oregon. Oh, there's another one in 
Michigan, Bay City. Hmm, makes you wonder, right? Well, yeah, because they, the people that started the second one said, well, actually it was started with a lumber company that was cutting all the material. And they said, um, we'd like to buy into this. We think you're, you've got a good thing here. We'd like to buy into it. And Aladdin said, no, no, we're not going to sell, sell you any part of it. So they thought, well, shoot, we're cutting all the lumber for it. We've got all the equipment. We'll just start our own. Well, not only then, but it happened again, right? Before Aladdin finally decided, well, I guess we better go work with our competition rather than create new. So you can see how this all documented across the uh, uh, state. Sears and Roebuck. 1916. Okay, so they they were not early, but within you can see a, a, a what 12 year span here. Uh, you really started populating the field, and the last ones that come in that were a major player was um, Montgomery Ward himself. Okay. But now, what happens? All right, depression, and the idea was a stock mop market collapses and the uh, depression ensues and it wrecks havoc in this world for a couple of reasons as we'll get into it. So which ones go out? First ones go out in 1928. In 31, Montgomery Ward. Short has lived of any of them. Okay. I mean, they only started, what, 1919? And they're out of business by 1930. One. So you can see how all these started, to, how the Depression left. To, but now we're getting after World War II, and you're seeing the 1950s, 1947, but who's still in there? Aladdin? Everybody in Michigan. Isn't that interesting? And they're all right there in Bay City, pumping out these houses right up until... Uh, very recently, what, 1973? Now, to me, that's recent, <laughs> okay? 1982, Aladdin, 1975. In fact, all Aladdin's materials, uh, it's on, um, uh, so if you weren't really want to do research on your Aladdin home, it's at Central Michigan University. They've got all the files on. Sad to say, Sears and Roebuck, they didn't keep any of theirs. They pitched everything. So I don't know if that was for fear of liability or what, but it's it, it's very hard to find anything. But you say, well, but some of those went, um, sure, the Depression played a role in it, but here's the other thing that really, I, and I was surprised at this, they were, mortgages were easy to come by, and oftentimes it was Sears or the builder that lent you the money to buy their product, right? So it wasn't really a mortgage, but it was. So where do you build it? Well, you build it on land that you bought. Now, you start put two to two together, right? All of a sudden, I can't make payments. I've got it on land that I own, and I built this house, and I quit making payments. Well, what am I going to do as a company? Am I going to go and take the house off of somebody else's land I don't have access to? Am I going to tear it apart and collect all the pieces? What am I going to do? And it just it created a havoc for uh, these manufacturers. And so you can see why they started to go out of business, because they didn't have any what they, collateral on the homes. But interesting story here. And you say, what in the world is Mickey Mouse doing up there? Well, I ran across this. I like these little tidbits. Mickey Mouse, 1928, uh, created by Disney, right? Disney Studio. Well, before um, uh, Walt and his brother got into the studio and, and th they decided that they bought some property and they bought a few kid homes that they built themselves. And they were going to turn these over. So this is a, a home just a few um, uh, blocks from the studio itself, but it's still there. And it was a kid home built by Pacific Ready Cut in uh, 1908. So even Walt Disney had this vision of how they could use these homes 
uh, and make a buck off of them, building them for other people on property that they would sell them. Harris Brothers down, this is Harris Brothers uh, in Chicago, 1910, they started. They actually, again, you look back into the research of some of these companies, um, they were a business of wrecking, tearing down. In fact, they had the honor of tearing down the Ferris wheel from the 1894 World's Fair, or the Columbia Exposition in Chicago. Okay, And they got to thinking, well, you know, what are we going to do now that it's all torn down, and then people started saying, well, we'll take this part, we'll take that, and they realized all of a sudden that, oh, there's money to be made in the parts that we can recycle. Let's begin putting this together as a house and salvage the parts and jump on this uh, idea of kit homes. And so by the time they were all done, they were out of the demolition business and they were in the kit home making. Interesting start there. Um, the Bennett Housing, now you can buy this catalog. I don't know if anybody, um, I, I have a copy, it's a reprint. Uh, Dover uh, Company printed it a number of years ago. It's a reprint of all the uh, Bennett homes of 1920. Um, it started out as a lumber company, which many of them did. And it was based out of New York. Uh, the company uh, offered kid homes for sale via the catalog um, during, uh, during this time. And again, you'll see many of the same homes would appear in catalogs that you just buy the plans for. It wasn't necessarily their design. So they were sharing designs, ripping off of one another, um, even off the catalogs or out of the, I want to say the uh, plans only for sale. Ray Bennett, uh, again, um, Oh, okay, yes. Uh, the Colonial Home in 1920 uh, sold for $4,200, okay. Colonial Home in 2016 it sold for $107,000. Now, I know a lot of this is location, 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 right? Uh, but this was a Bennett Home in uh, New York that sold for that. Ready Built House in 1911. They had a their little mobile shop that would go around to countryside and fairs and county fairs to advertising the quality of their home. And it was a little wagon in and of itself that was pulled around. Liberty Homes. Um, interesting here, this lasted for quite a while too. This was out of uh, Bay City. They built about 75 homes in uh, their total um, acreage. So you can see how the designs have changed. Uh, where you had the ranch style house, they were marketing that on them through the 50s and 60s. So they kept with the style of the time. They went away from the Victorian. They uh, went through the arts and crafts movement, a um, little bit even to the Art Deco. But when it got to ranch and the boom of that uh, industry during that time, they were right with it. Sterling Homes in 1916, again, they were out of Bay City. In part, they say, well, it was the Michigan timber industry, but I got to believe by 1916, 1920, timber was pretty much gone out of Michigan, uh, but these, these businesses were still, still thriving. Gordon Van Tine, this was, um, they really um, uh, established themselves in 1907, and they built most of the homes for uh, Montgomery Wards. So Montgomery Wards would advertise it in his name, but it was Van Tyne that was really building them. So the company was established in seven, but the kid homes weren't offered till 1916. Modern Homes, Sears and Roebuck, 1916. And this is what most people associate kid homes with, okay? And again, um, uh, Andrew and uh, Wendy Mutch, they, uh, they do an excellent job on this. They really zero in on, on company homes. Of course, they were selling building materials in 1895 through the catalog, right? But it wasn't until the 1916 that they began selling the pre-cut materials to do the kid homes. 
1908, they began selling building plans, and again, the kid homes appeared in 1916. So it was machine made. And when you look at it, it was versus old world craftsmanship. Now, we went through all the marking procedures. But when you look at how these homes were built and using old growth lumber, I don't know how many have heard of that uh, before, but old growth lumber um, was what was originally here. And the rings were much tighter. Today, we use wood that is um, harvested. I mean, it's, they're, they're planted, they're watered, they're cared for to grow fast, right? And if you compare the two woods between the old growth rings and young growth that we have today, big difference. Structural capacity and even fire resistance. I don't know how many old buildings I've been in where there's been a fire and the timbers are scorched, but they're still standing. It just like burned itself out now. Uh, there are other reasons old buildings go up, but the wood itself, in fact, even uh, fire department, the, the fire chiefs will say, yes, the new wood burns much faster, much quicker, much hotter, because it's more air, less less uh, wood growth. So you do have that. Um, spacing uh, of joists, usually it's two feet now. It was 14 and 3 eighths inches on center. So you had a stronger home, really, through the kit, kit construction. You had modern steam heating, okay, Sears and Roebuck, uh, hot water, um, additional options that you could buy. Um, you could have indoor plumbing for an option. And it's all ready pre-cut, no waste, no mistakes, no big labor bills. Uh, you got a backache, uh, yeah. I can see some of you raising your hand, no big labor bills. You still got to get it together, right? Oh, well. <laughs> so then, th this is the uh, Martha Washington house as it was advertised. Um, I enlarged the first floor and the second floor. Again, when this first came out, I think it was 1926 when it first came out. Um, and it sold for, what, less than 20, I don't know if it's up there, $2,700. Yeah, $2,700. Not a bad price, right? This is one in uh, Washington. It sold in uh, 2017 for $1.6 million. No, Washington, D.C. <laughs> So again, location, location, location. But it's still, th they recognize the quality of homes that were built. You know, the, the idea that the kit homes were less than uh, site-built homes doesn't hold true. You had just as a good a quality home, if not better, uh, than some of the site-built homes. But they also were at the other end of the, so I could buy a, um, already cut and fitted house for $399, right? $372. What is that, four bedroom? Or, or four room, not four bedroom. Four rooms. Now, I don't know if you can see it, but on that plan, do you notice anything? No bathroom. No bathroom. But fear not, because... Because for $41, you could get an outhouse to go with it. And it's portable, right. And, and if you really need the catalogs anymore, right? Yeah. You, I mean, they, they, they provided everything, right? They thought of everything all the way down. So then you say, well, what houses do we have around here that are like that? Well, uh, this is a Sears home. This was built, uh, this is uh, actually the, the picture, the photograph on the, my right, your left, okay, is at um, Hatchery Park out in Waterford. It's the um, Historical Society house. Uh, I'll call it clubhouse, but it's a house that they maintain and uh, that they hold their meetings at. 
Hatchery Park was a, a state-owned facility, one of the first in the state when they realized that the trout was uh, uh, being overfished and they decided that they should raise trout and plant them. So Hatchery Park was one of the first hatcheries in the park or in the state. Um, popular pre-cut, okay. Little changes, you can see where there was brick. They, uh, actually, this was purchased by the state and it was uh, built for the superintendent that ran the Hatchery Park before they turned it over to the township. Interesting little house, this is a five room neat bedroom. Again, these are all Sears houses. They call this the Crescent. And this is also in Waterford. Pretty well, uh, obviously the porch deck is new, but pretty much intact. Anybody recognize this? Royal Oak. But there are some in Rochester. In fact, you'd be surprised, and many people don't realize uh, that they're living in a kit home. We'll look at that in a minute. Um, there are a number of them, uh, almost in every city we have here in Oakland County. And you think about it, you say, well, gee, three of the major firms were right here in Michigan. Why wouldn't there be? Um, you just don't realize it. Um, in fact, Clawson, up until a few years ago, they had a home tour that was just kit homes. So you've got enough kit homes here, a home tour would be, I think, draw the people, depending on what I see here tonight. So all pre-cut, every piece, right? Notched and everything, just fit it together. Don't even have to use a saw, nail and hammers. Am I going the right way if I have this in here? I'm going backwards. I think I hit the wrong one there, didn't I? Yep, there we go. We even have a church, Sears and Roebuck. This is out in South Lyon, McHattie Park. You didn't realize they built, they, in fact, we'll see in just a minute how entire cities, you could buy buildings of every, remember how we talked about the uh, 59 homes at the, uh, one architect had in catalogs, and he'd also designed barn, and you could buy, well, the same thing happened with kit homes. It wasn't just kit homes. It could be kit churches, kit banks, kit schools. So this is in McCaddy Park in South Lyon. Uh, what was interesting, uh, they ordered this, and 15 weeks, weeks later, they had a church dedicated, their new building. Montgomery Wards, again, they, they were very short-lived. Uh, they came on the scene late, and they left relatively early uh, with the Depression. This is a kit home, and I think it's here in Rochester. At least I was told it was a kit home. Does anybody know for sure? So it, it could be. Okay, so Aladdin, I, and I saved this. I didn't take it in order like I did the other ones um, because they really did impact the total industry. 1906 to 1982 is when they were in business for this. So long lived. Uh, it was one of, the, well, it was the first and uh, the longest lived uh, of all the kit home manufacturers. Started by uh, two brothers, William and Otto. Okay. And again, they looked at not only um, kit homes and whole communities that you see here. Now you gotta remember at this time too, this is the 1920s, we had an influx of automobile workers. And General Motors was building Civic Park and Pontiac Housing for the Workers and uh, known as Modern Housing Corporation. Now they took a little different tack when they built, they would actually have an assembly line, but it was all site built. And they would put commodas over the house, they called them, and they would work 24 hours a day, seven days a week, to pump out these houses. 
and they would have one crew that would come by down the street. It was all laid out. They would dig the basement. Next crew would come in, pour the foundation. Next crew would come in, do the framing. Next one would come in, and it, it was uh, just a, uh, it was an automobile assembly line, but the workers moved from site to site. Uh, Pontiac, the modern housing. Oh, no, no, this is just, uh, this was some of the examples that Aladdin had uh, trying to sell these houses. But they also said, well, you know, yeah, you, we can do a school, we can do a bank, we can do any of these cities. Now, what was interesting was this is right around World War I, right, just after World War I. We haven't reached the real pinnacle of all this. In a 1920 catalog, it offered uh, uh, six complete cities that, um, that the military was asking for because the military was looking at this as, oh, this is revolutionary, and we can, when we need to build an army very quickly, where do we house them? And this was one way of doing it. So again, uh, Aladdin realized that assembly line techniques were well suited for standardization in uh, housing, military housing. And uh, it was a letter, they did it on a promise. They said, if you start building it today, we'll use it. This is at the start of World War II. And they went to work. It was an assembly line. Now, this is um, Civic Park in Flint, a little larger than the one in Pontiac, but they built 960 homes, an average of one home every eight hours. Isn't that incredible? It was an engineering feat. And uh, both uh, the uh, Modern Housing Corporation here in Pontiac and the one in Flint, uh, Pontiac is in much better shape, but uh, both of them are on the National Register, obviously, because of the engineering of it. And these were not Slough Hollow, I mean, they had slate roofs. And again, you had the quality lumber and materials that went into them. A lot of different styles. Now, after, well, at the start of World War II, I don't know, does anybody, well, I guess I got their name there, don't I? <laughs> I guess anybody recognize these two people? Ray and Charles Ames. Um, they were just down the road, right? They were at Cranbrook. And they were furniture designers. Well, I don't know how many know it, but the U.S. military came to them and they said, we're understanding that you're doing research in the bent plywood. Is there any application we can use in World War II? Oh, yeah, yes. Somebody knows their history, right? They invented, out of bent plywood, a cast that could be assembled. Well, nothing to assemble. You just put it on a person in the field. And it was all out of bent plywood. Also, the PT boat, all plywood constructed. Okay, We wanted cheap boats very quickly that could wreck havoc. And they were speedy little motor boats, really. Uh, of course, John F. Kennedy, you know, the famous PT-109. Right? But that was all out of bent plywood. And a lot of the research came right out of Cranbrook and what Ray and Charles Ames were doing. So after the war, um, you know, you recognize them for their furniture, right? The Ames chairs and stuff like that. Again, bent plywood. But then they were also asked to, well, what do you do with all this leftover military stuff? Now, at this time, they're in California. And they said, well, we've got an idea. Let's build a house. And it was uh, uh, access to all the technology. But let's use a lot of this material. And this is when we really started getting into modularization, which, again, boosts the whole kit industry. A uh, modular that we're living with today. What do we have in sheets of plywood? Four by eight sheets, right? Drywall, four by eight sheets. So there was this modularization. Our tiles up here, two by two, two by four. You know, everything is on a module basis. Our buildings are actually designed that way, the grid system. All started by, in part, by the work that Ray and Charles Ames did. So today, um, we have a, a resurgence, as I was saying, indicating if you go, if you Google Kit Homes, 
it's not the old catalogs that will come up. It will be the new ones. Yeah, the styles have changed a little bit. Now, the companies that originally started this market are long gone. But it, there's a resurgence. For all the reasons that they cited back in the 19-teens, as to the efficiency and everything that, that was happening, is still occurring today. We can still get the benefits out of uh, the kid homes. So I always say, okay, mom, where did our house come from? Okay, where do you tell them? Well, what do we look for? Look for the architectural style of your home, okay? Um, do you see it in the catalogs? More than likely, you probably will. In some catalogs, somewhere will have it. Now, that doesn't mean it's a kit home, but it's a good indication. Look for the physical evidence on the house, and we'll get a little bit more into that. Look for any documentation, and we'll get into that. How do you find what kind of documentation are we looking for? And I know this sounds really weird, but talk to your neighbors, okay, because they might have enough information about the neighborhood and about the house and who occupied it before you. Now, I was, just, I was talking, I just bought a, this is going to be my last house that I'm restoring, I'll tell you, I'm getting too old for this. I bought a 1906 house, and it was the neighbor I was talking to that found out all the families that lived there and gave me addresses where they had done some remodeling. So if I want, so I've got this complete history that I just have to go out and contact these people that are still here. So don't be afraid to ask neighbors. A lot of times there's uh, rumors. It could be a, a urban legend, but who knows? It also might be true. And keep an open mind, okay? For example, uh, honor built. You know, all the uh, detailing, I mean, you have remnants of a kitchen. Now, kitchens, are your, kitchens and baths are the first to go, right? But if by chance you should have one, uh, check it out with because there were a lot of uh, drawings inside the catalogs that would have what the living room is going to look like, what the bedroom would look like. Also, look on the rafters. I always, and somebody, I forget, somebody here, you were saying, I think, uh, HTC, if you look at the rafters in the basement or in the attic, there will be indicators. In fact, on your sheet, it, it talks about that, where to look. Different companies put them in different places, and they use different symbols, okay? But when you have markings like that, that's a pretty darn good indication that that's a, a kit home. Now, this is on a, a bathroom fixture, Sears and Roebuck, right? Again, if you find one of those, keep it, <laughs> because it, even if you resell it and you want to put it in new, that, that water closet, those sinks, uh, for somebody that is really looking to restore their home, that could be valuable for them. Think of it as a, a candy box, you know, or, or a game box. You get much more for that game if it's in the original box, right? Same for houses. So there, tells you, okay, this is go to the floor joist front, okay. And of course the documentation, um, sometimes, and I've even found this in attics, where people will toss the paper. So before you insulate your attic, if you haven't already, go through and really see what you find up there. It, it, I've, I've seen old doors that, wow, we didn't know we had that. And it, yeah, this door came out, you can match up the hinge holes and stuff like that, so you can find it. And then this is really incredible. Aladdin's, on some of their homes, they actually had doorknobs that were embossed. Now, Don, I think you were saying you grew up in an Aladdin home and it had the, bre or the clear glass crystal-like doorknobs. Yep, yep. So this one, I don't know. So whether your house is site-built, catalog, house uh, you sent away for the plans, or it's a kit house, you know what? We got you covered, and we'll leave the light on for you. Okay. Good. Thank you. I'll, I'll take any questions, but you might have stories that you'd like to share, too. Yes. Uh, yes, in fact, some of the, uh, now I'm probably too loud. Uh, I did notice that some of the kit houses actually are the tiny houses. 
Tiny houses, I don't know if you're familiar, uh, there's a program on, they're really efficiency, ergonomic, you know. Um, as I get older, I'm not sure they're suited for my life, <laughs> you know. Uh, I can't, I, I'm not quite as steady on the ladder as I used to be to reach up and get some of those. Uh, so be careful, but but there's a there's a lot of um, I, I guess waste that's cut down on the tiny houses. Why you know why does the footprint have to be two acres when we can better live on a an half acre and have all we can do to take care of it? It's all looking at the environmental and and cycle like that. We each have our own preferences, but yeah, I see a lot of similarities. Yes. You, you know, I, that's something I haven't calculated. It's a good question. I, would, I wouldn't think three times, but I could see twice. Uh, a lot of times, fixtures came with it. So it would be more the labor and, like, if you wanted a bathroom and things like that. Uh, but a basement, you would have to add uh, sometimes foundation block. See, block was invented in 1900, so they could send the entire shipment a block. Uh, but if you wanted a basement instead of a crawl space, it's going to cost you more. But that's a good question. I don't have a good answer. I would think at least maybe, again, half as much to twice as much. Yep. Yes. Yeah, well, you put me on the spot. No, <laughs> no, no, not really. I don't know. I, I'm somewhat reserved on that. Um, the reason is I've read some articles where, you know, we don't have a lot of shipping containers. We're not a port city like New York or, Ch or, uh, or San Francisco, you know, so we've got to haul those shipping containers in and... Um, I don't know, I'm just a little, little skeptic on it. You still got to do a lot of finish work, um, you know, to make it livable. Is there, you know, in uh, Hazel Park, and this is a, it's a great, it's made out of pop bottles, or bottles. So you try, and this was built like in 37. And they use the, the ends of the bottles. You, you can see them all over the house, and they're, they're stuck lengthwise in, so that wall is, that that thick, and uh, I got to believe the the you know the real insulation comes from airspace, and so if you can plug the other end of that bottle up, you've got a very well an insulated wall. And this is in thirty seven. So I used to challenge my students with this: uh, show me a, a, a environmental thing today that we're doing that hasn't been done a hundred years ago. Wind, oh, I got windmills in the farm, right? Yeah, a green roof. I'll show you a whole sod house. <laughs> you know, there's really nothing. We call it different, and we've improved the technology, but there's no revolutionary thing that we're doing today that hasn't been done before. We're just revisiting uh, old techniques. There was a question back here. Yeah, it is. Yeah. Uh, log homes, and, and actually they now take uh, wood, like uh, stack cords of wood, and they, rather than building logs horizontally, they put them in the end. So you have a cord of wood that you're connecting together to make a wall. There, uh, there's all, you know, the straw bale. In fact, there's, I think there's one in this area, straw bale house, where they actually use straw bales, and they coat it with a, a parging of mud or plaster, just like the stucco that we used on uh, a lot of our homes. So, yes. Oh, you're going to ask me that. Um, you know where the GM plant is there? Oh, boy, which one? You're going to stick me there, too. Yeah, Pontiac Motor Division. Um, they, th is, there's a park there. Um, 
the streets are laid out curvilinear. If you give me your name, I, I feel really embarrassed because I, I don't know the streets that well in Pontiac, but I can give you a location for it. There, it's undergoing revitalization. Um, interesting story there. Uh, a gentleman grew up in Pontiac, went away, you know, had, uh, was an executive, traveled the world, came back and bought his childhood home and has restored it. And he has got the neighborhood group now uh, started and the homes that were selling for, you know, what, five, six thousand dollars are now going for seventy thousand, eighty thousand. So he's really started a, a revitalization effort there. But if you leave me your name and anybody wants, um, I'll, I'll be happy to copy you on anything. I'd like to hear some stories though, because I know uh, several of you grew up or owned. Any stories you want to share? Well, you know, in some of those kid homes, uh, I mean, they basically covered every design from the Tudor, which had the low sloped roof and the round door, the uh, round door top. Uh, I mean, they covered it all. I don't know what I'd do if I had a arched door and how I'd ever get another door for it. I mean, I don't, they, you can find them, but they're very expensive though too. So. Anyway, go home and check. I'd be curious to see um, who comes up with a kit home. And uh, keep an eye out.